uh, uh, turn around, honestly. This is the most important video I'll ever make, that you'll ever watch. I don't know, it might not be. Okay, hope you can hear me using some of the old tech. Uh, play some music in the background. This is David Bowie, uh, a song called Young American. And uh, when the tape flips over, it should be Porter's head, which is just the best music to have in the background talk. So I'm obviously planning to do a long video. The battery holds up there, and again, so for YouTube music, whatever, Porter's head and David Bowie. And I'll put it in the description. Right, well, I've kind of been holding off making a video. I haven't really, hadn't really collated enough to talk about. Um, so we'll, we'll see. But um, yeah, my last video, I believe, was March 7th. And I was saying how things happened on the 8th. <laughs> did I make it on the 8th? I don't think I did. Where's my little time chart? Because I added it to it. 8th of March. So we had three things happen. I think I did talk about this, didn't I? Oh, sure. Harry and Meghan interview. Farage quits the Reform Party. Richard Tice takes over. And the schools went back. Uh, well, we knew about the Harry and Meghan interviews coming up, that's scheduled, scheduled, I prefer to say now. And the schools were going back, and that's the UK. But Farage quits the Reform Party, what, again? I mean, I'm actually a member, I'm actually standing for the Reform Party. <laughs> uh, interesting, I am actually going to... That's actually, what? Nothing to do with the Reform Party, or maybe it is. Not that I know of, but I do have my suspicions. The Enigma of London Square Mile. So might as well, hey producer, call the video, The Enigma of London Square Mile. <laughs> I don't think I had a producer, and then, well, they probably just annoy me, just as well as I don't. This is still David. I don't know how well you can hear it. I don't know how hear it. There we go, there's the end of the tape. Good old tapes, how you just squeeze on, you know, an eighth of a song, why not? <laughs> I think that's all I want to hear that one. Yeah. Um, I haven't heard this for a long time. It's so chilly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I used to make videos in my late teens and stuff. Uh, <laughs> I made this video of me getting up and talking, but the music so loud, you, you know, you can't really hear what I'm saying. Probably just as well. <laughs> Sounding quite good. I'd like to get some of those on videos, shove them on the digital. I don't even know where they are, I haven't got the HS point, so... It's not likely going to happen. So we've got, some more, so we've got some things to talk about before we talk about the Enigma of London Square Mile. And how, you know, maybe the preconception is that it would be a bad thing. You know, one of those assumptions that turn out to be wrong. Uh, I'm going back a page. I'll go back a page. I shouldn't do this because I just seem about it, don't you? Right. <clears throat> so, let's just talk a bit topical about what's going on at the moment. It sort of leads me to one of my main points, which is what is God's plan? You know, what did we think? I've been making videos and just been saying, you know, let's just wait and see what God does. You know, I had no idea really what God was going to do. In a sense, we all just wanted God to come down and just sort it out. Well, you see, what needs to be done before that can happen is we need to expose the problems fully. And that's what God is doing. God is part of God's plan. Anything that's happened is part of God's plan once it's happened. So the exposure is coming out. Now, some of it's coming out very slowly, the sex trafficking and stuff. And I guess the bigger and more shocking the exposure is going to be, the more slowly that plaster needs to be ripped off. You know, first of all, people need to be sort of hear about it and get a high, you know, or I'm sure it's just a bit of fun or whatever. Yeah. Probably find a load of money, you know, that's a prostitutes. And maybe if they were a bit young, you might not be sure. You know, they 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, you know, you couldn't tell necessarily. Um, but because it, you know, and there's a judge, the judge seeing Ghislaine Maxwell's case has said outright, you can't make some of the stuff public because it just feels it's too shocking to the public. So it seems like the blaster isn't just being ripped off. It's, you know, that sort of pick it up little by little, use a bit of water, <laughs> so it doesn't hurt, you know. God didn't put the plaster there in the first place, God wouldn't do that. <laughs> to take the analogy fully, but God is taking the plaster off, it's got to come off the deal. You've got to expose that, you know, if you think you've got some rust bubbling through the paintwork of your car, you know, you need to run it back and see if it's spreading and to treat it, to sort it out. You've got to expose it. Do you know what I'm saying? I think you do. I think it's pretty obvious. So, you know, we are, we're all racist. We're all racist, accept it. You're always going to prefer your own mix of genes to others. You're going to think your mix of genes is the good one. The one that you'd stick up for. So, when you see someone else with a similar mix of genes, stick up for them. Now, you can't judge by skin colour, because you could have more in common with someone with a different skin colour than with someone with the same kind of skin colour. Genetically, I'm just talking purely down to the DNA. <clears throat> the rule sexist is the same thing with the women and the men. Men can't know what it's like to be a woman, and women can't know what it's like to be a man. We are different, as much as you want to pretend we're not. And someone can pretend they're a woman and have all the operations and vice versa. But if they're not, they're a bloke doing it, or a woman doing it. We're all racist and we're all sexist. Yeah. You know, when these things come up, the presenters on the radio and whatever, often they'll come out like they're whiter than white. <laughs> they're purer than pure. And, you know, act like they've never done a sexist thing in their life or never ever had a racist thought. You know, they're just not being honest. 
So that is the issue. So I put here, the, the nation of the United Kingdom. We are racist, we are sexist, and above all, we are dishonest. Quite right. It's honest. It's a bit Irish accent. We're all racist. We're all sexist. But above all, we're dishonest. <laughs> Anti-Irish. I'm not anti-Irish. But I mean, we've got this age-old divide going on, you know, the EU, the Catholic EU, the Catholic Irish, the Catholic Scots, all causing trouble for the Protestant English, the Protestant Dutch, the French, I don't really know what they are. And that will come up again as well. So God's plan is to expose, expose the problems, expose what's wrong. And it is, it is uh, issues that we all have. Uh, that stops us from for caring for our brothers and sisters in a loving way, which we should. So as evil pokes up its head, love is revealed as it is beckoned. <laughs> I that very well. I also, a shorter version, saying, evil awakens sleeping love. You know, so if you were going around thinking, it wasn't this evil, it was all good, and you kind of weren't in truth, there was a, there was a part of you which was asleep to the truth of the situation, even though you couldn't have been aware of it. Because it existed, because it was truth, the part of you was asleep to that evil. And when it's exposed, that part wakes up like a leaping unicorn, <laughs> galloping with its magical rainbow row, and then save the day, shine a light on the evil, in a scary way. To solve the problem, you must first expose the full extent of the issue, then take appropriate action. Yeah, I I've just done all those things before. Right. I should make a little squiggly line to say, no, I did this um, So I'll just do it in order. I might forget stuff. Uh, so, something else I posted on Facebook. Uh, we were more our true selves when we were young. Okay. So I, I wanted to make it. Not too specific. Because I don't get much reactions on Facebook. You probably know if you're watching. Um, so in my mind, with this vague statement, the more untrue cells are moving, I've got some comments, a couple of comments. One of them saying, um, <clears throat> not me, I'm more outgoing now than when I was younger. Somebody else was saying, and my reply to both of them was, go even younger. Because, you know, we hit our first obstacles pretty young, and they're quite traumatic, hence the terrible twos and threes. Uh, it is very traumatic. I mean, you see a child, they want to throw themselves against, you know, <laughs> they're doing something, and you want to pick them up and throw themselves like that, don't they? Really, like, and they, and they don't want to do something, just everything about them. Just, and we should really listen to that in children. If they're so vehement about what they want, then blindly, why fight them? And often it's over the stupidest little things. We've got to go out now, you know? And then if they actually thought about it, do they have to go out now? You know, maybe often they don't. Sometimes perhaps they do. So a kid can't always have it his way. But part of that rejection of the parent's guidance is because they've already been thrown way off the path by their parent's guidance. Because they come out of the womb basically knowing all of it. They just can't communicate it. As, I don't know why I say they, we, us. We knew it all when we came out of the womb. They can't communicate it. They just miss mostly feeling. So they feel the errors in the parents very early on. So when I say go younger, you know, I was thinking about the time when I felt like I was uh, getting feelings and images from when I was in the womb. And I was thinking about, I was remembering it, because it was during a plane ride, most of it, some before and after. And there was issues, feelings I was dealing with, that perhaps came from when I was in the womb. It was quite strange, deep feelings. But I had this, I had this image in my head of, the best way I can describe it is, well, the easiest way I can describe it is, you know, um, the Star Wars spaceship, I can't remember what it was called, that spaceship that was used in Star Wars. And when they're inside, they're not driving it in the, in the little lounge bit. You've got some seats and a little table, right? So imagine that sort of modernity. And it was just sort of, was it a table in the middle or something? It's kind of, got sort of soft, like a bar in a sense. And everything was like black and red. Check, black and red. So it's like a round room, something in the middle, black and red, like patches, let's say. There were, I don't know, 10 to 12 or more sort of things. Like red, black, red, black, red, black, red, 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 black. But clear as a bell. No blurriness whatsoever. And I suppose because those are the images that came to me at the time, you know. I thought, you can't even see it the way, you know, your eyes aren't even developed. So I thought about it. And when I've been meditating recently, so I've been meditating with open eyes for quite a long time. 
So I'm not just looking ahead at the wall, and I've got this piece of paper over there, and there's lines writing on it. And so that's obviously the main faces. Often faces, I see faces in them. There's a particular faces that I often see, depends on the angle that I'm, I'm seeing it. Sometimes it's a woman, sometimes it's a man, but suddenly the face becomes very clear, you know, even though I'm making it out of, you know, and I'm not wearing my glasses and I'm doing it. So they're just lines on sheet paper, my writing, but just different length lines and spaces and stuff in it. When it makes a face, it suddenly becomes clear. So I thought, you know, when we're, in, when we're a baby, you know, blurry vision, or even if we had no vision, or just even a slight bit of vision. We would, especially with our capabilities then, we would certainly make clear images. Because so why when I'm in things, why do these sometimes clear images come out? I've even heard it before where the whole wall of my room becomes like a, a face. That's not a problem. Why do they suddenly become so clear and defined? Because obviously we're, we seek to see clarity, we don't seek to see blurred, do we? So, blurred images take on a cacophony of very clear images. It is a cacophony, they can be very different. Before our vision became clear, even in the womb, we would have had a clear picture, continuously. And when you sleep, you have a clear picture, don't you? Oh yeah, and then I <laughs> tried to tempt some people into a little riddle. Well, I came up with something that was like, this is quite interesting, actually. It says, So I have one of those, <clears throat> late at night, like revelations. Oh, God, that's such a good thing. I'm going to write down. If it's good, you will come back to me. Anyway, so the next day, I was sitting thinking, oh, I thought it was really good last night. Oh, yeah, God, oh, I'm nearly there. What was it? And I can't remember. And then I know not to force it or try because it won't work. So later on, it came back to me. I remember now. Pretty sure it was that. It was, it was, it was. So I didn't want to go on Facebook and go, oh, I've got this brilliant thing that I've come up with. <laughs> I probably did want to do that, but I have to accept it's not me. You know, I'm making, I'm getting in points where I'm connecting with love and God, and then things just come to me. So I just got something else. <laughs> so it came back to me, and uh, so I put it on Facebook. Um, there's an everyday object that brilliantly defines. What a soul is in its reference to being both male and female. Any guesses? Any ideas? Well, she got nothing. All right, put it in the comment. Don't leave me. Any ideas? Any guesses? An everyday object that can be a really good analogy for how a soul is both male and female. Come on. <laughs> You're gonna pick it, eh? Hey? Mm -hmm. I've got it in my hand. It's in my hand. It's in this hand. Guess what it is, yeah? No, it's in this hand. Guess what it is? <laughs> a coin. We always think of a coin as heads or tails. Both completely different. Not necessarily opposite. But both completely different, yet yeah, on one thing. So, so the heads and tails, masculine and feminine. Both one and the same, yet completely different. Different identities. So, thank you for the card, I guess. Usually. <laughs> Giving me my, my my food, my meat. What are we? Oh, this is this is world, isn't it? <laughs> what are we? I talked a bit about storytelling, and now I'm no good at it. We are stories. The paper is love. Thing is love. And it, the ink is what we are. Another good analogy for how it's a symbiotic relationship. You know, if you had nothing to write, nothing to put the ink on, you would never story. Without the ink, just a plain paper, there would be no story. Now, some people might think that's just this short life that is your story, your beginning and your end. But it isn't. I can't prove that to you, but everything I've ever talked about has always been about this. And this life isn't really life. It's just a chapter in a story. And in fact, a word in a story. How's that? And it can be a bloody big book as well. It's one word in a story. But your story is important. And you're living it. So every word, <laughs> every word of your final story is important. But this life isn't the whole story. And you'd know this if you'd managed to go back to younger memories because I guess the previous life is flashing into the new life, still, at a young age, especially with the capabilities we have. You might not know, but you'd definitely be very suspicious, because you think, well, when you start to have a feeling of what you are, you know, then you know you couldn't have just come from nothing in a short time. But there's been a, a lot of layering up, a lot of experiences, a lot of things just come natural, like being in a family just seems really normal when you're a kid. You're a family or a group. It's a really, really natural feeling. But you've done it 
many, many, many times before. And many other things that you've done many times before. You get a realisation for that. And I was thinking the other day, and I remember this before, when I was about four years old. I was stuck in a cobstopper in the lounge of my old house in North Yorkshire. And I took it out of my mouth and it was all parts of it blue and parts of it were green. And I thought, oh, it looks like a planet. Now, when I thought about this, I thought, yeah, I'd probably seen on the BBC, you know, the globe. Um, I'd probably even heard of, perhaps, Mars or Venus, but I thought I didn't really recollect them. And besides, they, they look like that. But I didn't think... I just seem to remember, I thought planet, like as in general, a general planet. And I'd always had, I said, look, looked at the stars and things and wondered what they are, I just thought, well, there are other suns. And so I obviously had an idea that we were a planet near the sun and that there'd be planets around the other suns. Anyway, probably shouldn't labour too much on that, just a thought I had the other day. But it's likely that we will have an end at some point. I mean, at some point, you know, after billions and billions of years, and you, know, you feel like you must have done it all. I don't want to speculate too much because we're so new. If you think about, um, take the age of the universe, it's about 13, 15 billion years old, I guess. Planet Earth is about 4 billion years old. Now, maybe we were here from the beginning as a little bacteria under the water, and 300 million years ago the Earth started changing, expanding, and the land rose above the oceans for the first time. Maybe that's when we started. So, the universe is that much older, 10 billion years older. Well, that's how old our mother and father God is. So much life they've had. And they've created offspring. <laughs> We're all part of this eternal tree of life. And the sap flow flowing through the tree is love. And we're living out our lives, our stories. Sometimes you like it. Sometimes you don't. A bit like that electron, isn't it? Sort of coming in and out of existence. And then you choose. You want it to carry on. <laughs> That's your innate need. It's a, everyone has to face that point, that slightly lonely point where you can feel like you can choose to continue or not. But I get reassurances from God all the time. And even I'd say from beyond God, imagine so God's father and mother and their father and mother and each one of them's got 100 billion children, so it's just vast numbers by this stage. Hardly comprehensible. I always kind of, when I first thought that, I always thought it'd be about seven. <laughs> then I decided to stop thinking about it. Because I did kind of get sucked through it all to, f to meet Source. <laughs> In my mind, when I visioned it, it Source like this triangle pyramid thing of hard light. I always thought we all had that in our, in the core of our soul as well. You know, when we were created, when God first created our souls, sort of begun with that sort of hard core, hard light. You wouldn't create something like that for it to be able to be extinguished. So even if at those times when I felt like I had to make the decision, did I want to exist? Did I want to choose to love the bee, right? If I had gone, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm sure that, you know, someone would have swung in and helped, you know? I mean, it's kind of what I think the rock bottom's all about, isn't it? When you hit that rock bottom, and you go, yeah, it's pretty shit. If this is the bottom, then I'm cool with it. We've got a deal. Let's, uh, let's make stories. <laughs> I'm quitting mockers because of my teeth. Pipping up my um, the mocker. Why are they ban the mocker in Morrison's and McDonald's? It must be something dodgy. Can't just be because it's too expensive. Probably just that combination probably is really bad for the teeth. Coffee and chocolate. Quite, quite similar, in a way, aren't they? Similar luxuries. And you just sort of asking for too much, putting them together, and you're just like. That's the word debauchery. So that's what we are. We're stories. Living, active, very, very, very long stories. Another thing on the exposure. Uh, the stupidity of those pushing the vaccine, right? These celebrities and royals and politicians, or just know not to trust the politicians, but the others coming out and saying, you know, you should get the vaccine, do, 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 do. This just exposes their stupidity or their blind faith in, in what they're being told by their experts. And I suppose their thing at the end could be, well, that's what we were told was the truth, so based on that, that's what we said. So then it doesn't expose their stupidity, it exposes their congeniality. Is that a word? Probably not. Their compliance with just, you know, relying on the latest harebrained idea or something, right? Or just the lack of empathy. <laughs> and also, yeah, they could be injecting anything into them, couldn't they? Just a plain placebo or something for all we know. Plus, if you're old, it doesn't matter, you're not really risking anything, your immune system's not that active anyway, so it's probably not going to produce that many issues for you to deal with, but... 
stupidity, right? So we're exposed to a virus anyway. So a lot of people have had to go out and face it anyway. If you've had the real McCoy, and you've faced it and beaten it off, to then have some slightly weird version of it, bypass all your defences straight into your bloodstream, just complete stupidity. And um, being exposed. Right, getting into the, uh, getting into the big one now. Before that, what I wrote down earlier, because I'm always thinking about the Christ and stuff. It annoys me that everyone's going around, oh, the Christ is in you. You know, you're just using the wrong words. The chosen one isn't in you. <laughs> anyway, so I, I'm flattening a spoon with a sledgehammer. Do you, so I can use it as a bit of a trial, because I'm doing some stuff. And, um, not dodgy stuff, I'm making cement. <laughs> Playing around, trying to make hard cement. And uh, my son really likes this flattened spoon, so he wanted to keep it anyway. So I had to make another one today. Big same one. So I'm going, all right, you know, all my spoons, by the way, are the same. They're all the same. So I open the drawer, grab a spoon, you're the chosen one. And that spoon becomes the trail that I'm actually going to use, and have used today. How do I pick it? I just grab it. Maybe that's what God does sometimes. So the theory behind the Christ, okay? So it's in the Bhagavad Gita, slightly different. But there's some backup for it. The super soul is what they call God in the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita. So it's come down, it comes out about every thousand years or so. It's Krishna talking, the blue guy. So he's saying, like, I'm, you know, I don't know if he, because he doesn't really claim to be God, just that he's kind of got the super soul connection or something, right? So that was my theory about, you know, if Adam was the first Christ and Noah was the second, and Noah was a different colour, and maybe he's the blue guy in the Bhagavad Gita. And Abraham was the third, and then David was the fourth. And it's every thousand years. And it has, and I thought lately, as, you know, we are reincarnating, um, did they play a role, you know, was, was Moses also David? Was um, but uh, also Abraham also. You know what I mean? Like, because they lived in the five hundred years. So maybe every few lives, you know, the chosen one of that thousand year period has some cool shit. And maybe he has a nemesis as well. Maybe like the Antichrist. It's part of the story. And so whoever you are, you will either have experienced this at some point of a billion year old we are, or you will come to experience it within the next billion years or whatever. You get probably turned to be in the anti to be in the pro, right? Maybe they're really sure which one you are. Or, or not. Or maybe so. Right, let's get on with it. Now, the video is called The Enigma of London Square Mile. And the next thing that I've written down is Who needs 37 billion pounds? <laughs> 37 billion pounds is the amount of money that we wasted on the track and trace system. Now, how could you possibly waste 37 billion pounds on the track and trace? By the way, when the media talk about it, they often accidentally said 37 million. It's been confirmed. It was 37 billion pounds on some app <laughs> that never worked. Perhaps never intended to work. And then you never bloody wanted it. So, that's a good way to kind of get hold of 37 billion pounds. And most people probably assume, the way the politicians are, that that was done for nefarious means. In other words, bad shit. But I'd like to insert a little <laughs> quick pro crawl. <laughs> I'd like to insert a little doubt into that theory. It's been said that um, JFK was an asshole. So then why they kill him? I think we've always had a feeling that JFK was a good guy. A good guy. I mean, a lot of speech and saying he's going to expose this shadow government that existed back then. Before he was killed, by the way. So he never got around to exposing them. But in order to actually get into power, apart from a lot of money, he kind of needed to bluff them. To say, yeah, I'm your man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lucky. I'll roll over. <laughs> Tickle my belly. I'll do what you tell me to do. In order to get into power. And then once he was in, he could start to try and you know, fuck him over, expose him, do the match. Now, we all know now that Trump is just, just a good guy. Just a guy doing things with blonde hair on his head. It's a bit highly of God as well. But Boris Johnson, you know, you have to have, to have hope. You have to have hope that, you know, now and then there's there's some, someone good there, someone who might do some good. So he might have had to do a bit of, I mean, at the end of the day, he might have had to do a bit of, um, this is a long video, he might have had to do a bit of, you know, Showing them that he was going to play the game. And he needs 37 billion pounds in order not to be corrupt. So that's my little insert creeping doubt into that he would, it would be for greedy, selfish means. Was to line his pockets, do it early in his prime ownership, he might lose, you know, that sort of mentality. And he might be like that, and I can't say he's not, I haven't met him. So I just have to have hope. I think my, my battery's not around. So he might need that 37 billion pounds so that he doesn't, so that he can fend off people, you know, shoving billions and pounds under his nose and saying we need this and sort of feeling like, oh god, we need the money, we need money for the campaign or whatever. I don't know. That's what I'm thinking. Now, the enigma of London Square Mile. So, the enigma is that when William the Conqueror conquered England, the one place he didn't conquer was London Square Mile. So that was in 1066. That's nearly a thousand years ago. 
There's a small place. Oh, I don't need it. And Viking invasion started in the 800s or something like that. And they never got to London Square Mile. They were interested in having a bit of land here and there, raiding and pillaging, things with gold. But before 1066, they converted to Christianity. In fact, the Normans were Vikings. They'd taken over Normandy. The Vikings. We didn't conquer as Vikings. They didn't conquer London Square Mile. There wasn't the Vikings who were holding Square Mile before, because they never got that far in. I imagine. I think. I don't know. We were supposed to be only a small area. And if they fend off William the Conqueror, is well protected. Now, if we look at the uniforms that they wear, they're a bit like the Swiss Guard, aren't they? I mean, they're, they're nothing Viking. There's nothing Viking about them. So they're not Viking. So they're pre Viking. So they're pre 800. And we had the Romans pretty much leaving Britain by 400. Right? So we've got 400 years. 400 years for there to be something, I'd like to say, good. Something good in that square mile of London. It's obviously given some power to England. What is it? It's the financial district of London at the moment. You can assume, therefore, evil. Money, root of all evil. That's what I'd always assume. <coughs> when they tried to have the Occupy protests in that square mile, they weren't having a bar of it. How long did they last there? An hour? They got different police. There's loads of um, uh, symbolism and stuff on buildings there. A guy called Sam, you know, you would have heard him on YouTube. Sam Williamson or something. And he hadn't done a video in ages, but he, he was doing stuff on it. And he also had the point of view that it was a negative thing as well. Um, well, so within that 400 years, the Romans, you, know, you might think, oh, so the Romans kept going. Possibly. Possibly it is evil. <laughs> but the Romans were finished. If they'd kept that going, that may have become the new centre. Yeah, the Romans were finished. And they would have been more into Catholicism, wouldn't they, if it was the Romans? It wouldn't be a Protestant country. What's kept as Protestant as well? What's kept our monarchy? Is there something in that square mile in London which is referred to as the woman in Revelations? How many times has London been so close to invasion? Was it that they were after? research needed, maybe. Another link to the Reform Party. Uh, Nigel Farage is very well known that he was a stock exchange guy buying metals. <laughs> so, and this new Richard Tice, well, we'll see. He goes on. He'd be quite fortunate that there's a by-election coming up in the constituency that he's representing, partly Paul, having a by-election in this many. Very convenient. I mean, maybe that's why they chose the seat. But I like to still think on the side of positive, because I like being positive. That's the way I like to live my story in a... <laughs> Expectation of happy things. I like to wander around the forest path, whistling, carrying my basket, and um, have a jolly good time. So, that's that. I hope you're still recording. Very red, orange video. Anyway, uh, ciao, bye.